Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, as you might have been able to figure out, I've been on vacation for a week. Uh, anyway, I'm back and I was in New York City and I had a wonderful time. So my sister Janet, hi Janet. Uh, but it was interesting because uh, today, uh, my sister had been after me about doing a Q&A and so today we're gonna do one. Had a lot of really, really great questions from you all and some of them kind of tough. Many of them are tough, but I will try and answer them as best I get, as best I can. And of course, as always, the Secretary of HHS may not totally agree with my comments, but that's that's okay. So the first one was interesting because the question is: I have a friend that just came down with influenza last week. Is it still around? And it was funny because I was with in New York City, and I went out to dinner with some old friends, and they said you're lucky it was this week because last week I had influenza, and I said. Well, what kind of influenza? It turned out it was influenza A, which goes against everything we've been sort of talking about, but it's still around. The, the point is, if you look at this season, the red line with the red circles is this year's influenza season, and the dotted line represents sort of the, the average uh, number of respiratory infections that present. And it's well below, but it's not zero. I guess that's the main point, is there's still influenza around, and so people, when they show up with fever and headache and a cough, you know, may, and this woman also, my friend, had been vaccinated. So it shortens the duration and it doesn't cause a severe illness. But the thing that surprised me is I've shown you this a few weeks ago, that late in the season, it really has been influenza B mostly, that all the yellow bars are influenza A, the green bar is B, and it's been, B has been later in the season, and yet she still had influenza A. So I don't know. It's still around, so it's always you consider it when somebody comes into the respiratory uh, infection. So this is a good one. I don't hear about bird flu anymore. Where did it go? I mean, it was for a while. I was talking about it almost every week, and I haven't been. Well, it's because there haven't been a lot of cases recently. So it's still widespread in wild birds. If you sort of add up where it's been, it's still in the poultry industry and in dairy cattle. There have been up to 70 cases, but we haven't had one in a while, one uh, death. And if you look at where those 70 human cases have come from, it's in workers that were 41 from uh, dairy cattle industry, 24 in poultry farms, two from some animal exposure they don't know, or three from unknown exposure, and two from uh, local, like people raising chickens in their backyard. This is the the case number, you, and the dark blue is more cases, lighter blue less cases, and I want you to keep this in mind, this intensity on this coast and sort of this central area and in the Midwest, because it's all dependent upon where the waterfowl are flying. So the reservoir, of course, is in waterfowl. Uh, they tend to congregate in breeding sites in the, in the, in the spring, and then they fly down to where they overwinter. And many of the, fly, the flight zones are across North America, mostly on the west coast of North, North America. And if you look at the cases of bird flu over, since 2022 in the United States, this is uh, uh, where most of the outbreaks have been in, in poultry industry. You can see most of them are along the west coast, some in that middle, some in the sort of mountain states, fair number in the Midwest and not so many on the East Coast. And that is consistent with the major flyways of waterfowl. So you can see there are four major flyways, the Pacific Flyway, Central Mississippi, and Atlantic Flyways. So you, this is how the, the poultry industry and this is how cattle get it. It's from wa the fowl, waterfowl that are now migrating and, and they go down these particular flyways. So where did it go? The reason we haven't talked about it much is it sort of peaked and then it's begun to fall. So the blue represents the number of dairy herds affected, not number of cattle, but dairy herds, so large numbers of cattle, and the number of human cases. And you can see it really peaked around October, November, and it's really dropped quite a lot. This is the commercial poultry flock, flocks in, affected. Again, hundreds of millions of chickens, but you can see it really peaked, peaked around January and February, and the cases in, in people uh, at the same time and not much going on right now. And then this is backyard flocks of chickens affected and you can see again. So the reason we haven't been talking about it much is because it's gone. It turns out it's somewhat seasonal. It's very much dependent upon the, the migratory patterns of waterfowl. All right. So this is, an, <laughs> this is another tough one. 
Uh, in your weekly videos, you had suggested that workers with cow herds and with, uh, with bird flu and workers with chicken flocks with bird flu should be vaccinated. I assume that implied there's a, a, a bird flu vaccine for humans. RFK Jr. canceled uh, the Moderna project to produce an mRNA vaccine for bird flu. Why was the mRNA version needed? Was the existing vaccine not producible in mass quantities? I've seen it reported that the cancellation cost $175 million. Okay, <laughs> good questions. Okay, the, the, the fact is that the U.S. has licensed H5N1 vaccines since 2007 for adults uh, and two have been approved for children. So there are three vaccines that have been licensed for production since 2007. Two have been licensed, or th all three for adults, two for children. They're mostly stockpiled for emergency use. They're not widely given. They're stockpiled just in case we have an outbreak. If, if we start seeing people, the person-to-person -person transmission, uh, the government can quickly deploy these already made vaccines that are sitting in warehouses. The trouble is that each year the strain changes. It, it's much like influenza, other influenzas. And this particular strain that is circulating now is different from the strains that have been stockpiled. And so the FDA had suggested to the manufacturers that they produce a whole bunch of updated vaccines just in case we have an outbreak. And what's great about the mRNA vaccines, as we've seen, is they, they have an advantage and they can be developed very quickly to the newest strains. So if you were to think about being prepared for a, a, a potential pandemic with bird flu, H5N1, that would have to evolve from the current forms to a more contagious form. So by definition, if it started spreading from people to people, that would be a different form than what's in. And so we'd need to make a vaccine to that form. And the mRNA technology provides a tremendous advantage for that. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, this is a question about MMR boosters. I just got an MMR booster and pneumonia shot this AM. I did a measles titer, which didn't show much IgG, so I decided to get it while vaccines are still available. Things are getting so bad. <laughs> oh, never mind. Then there's an editorial comment, uh, <laughs> the thing, which I will not read. Uh, the one thing I wasn't sure is, do I need two MMR shots? The pharmacist didn't say anything that I like. I needed to come back, but I thought I did. Is that or is that only for little kids? For so, the, for most adults, just one booster shot is all that's needed unless you fall into a particularly high risk. Now, in most people, you don't need it at all. But in the adults, if they measure their IgG or they're worried about risk, they can go get a booster. Uh, the, there is a subgroup that is recommended for two shots. One are healthcare workers. Uh, second are students who are uh, in, med uh, in, in colleges, so you know, university students. If you plan to travel internationally, you have a, a close contact with someone who's known to have a weak immune system, or you were vaccinated in that window uh, where the, from 63 to 67, where the measles vaccine wasn't very sure, uh, wasn't very good. But so if you're unsure about your history, you can always get an extra dose, uh, and that will help ensure protection. Well, here's another one on measles. I'm planning to travel to Europe this summer. Should I be concerned about measles? <laughs> Yes, you should. <laughs> holiday, measles holiday warnings are, has, have been increased in Europe. There's been a bunch of published things about warnings. What should we do? Okay, so uh, in Europe, measles are an absolute 25-year high. Uh, we talk about having 1,200 cases, which, which is very high for us. There are over 127,000 measles case, cases in Europe. The uh, vaccination rate in England, particularly in London, are extremely low. You remember we talked about you have to be 95% or more to prevent outbreaks. London is down to 73%, which is very, very low. And there have been outbreaks in many different countries. So France, Italy, Spain, Germany. Uh, the WHO has reported outbreaks in Romania, Pakistan, India, Thailand, Indonesia, and Nigeria, <laughs> many places I've been to. And anyway, um, I think the biggest concern is if you are parents of young children, you should make sure that everybody is up to date with two MMR vaccines. Uh, that's the most important thing. You know, the, the ki that usually happens is adults are protected, they haven't gotten their kids vaccinated, and they go abroad where the kids are exposed to measles. So if your kids are, the best thing is to be vaccinated. Be sure you're vaccinated and catch up with your vaccines. Okay. Then someone just asked about where we stand with measles this year. As I mentioned, we're bad, but we're not as bad as Europe. Up to 1,214 cases. There have been 23 outbreaks, and the outbreak is anytime you have three or more cases. 
Um, and we've had 12% of all the cases have been um, hospitalized, three deaths. You can see we're sort of coming down on, this is uh, cases by week, uh, based on uh, onset of the rash. This is yearly measles cases. We're kept catching up to tw uh, 2019, where we had 1274, we're up to 1214. And most of those cases are in Texas, 750 cases. And almost all, 95% of those cases are due to people who have not, kids have not been vaccinated. Okay, COVID. I just read that under 65 will no longer qualify for COVID vaccines. In an upcoming video, I hope you can cover what that means for those of us that are in this category and would still like to receive one. Cost, insurance coverage, reliability of the vaccine, all those things. Will the pharmaceutical companies want to produce them, et cetera? Lots of questions. So, yes, <laughs> you're right, lots of questions. So, as of now, uh, the FDA and CDC are prioritizing COVID vaccines for anybody who's 65 and older. Uh, they also recommend uh, getting a vaccine if you're six months or older with at least one high risk condition, and those include chronic illnesses like asthma, chronic obstructive lung disease, heart disease, diabetes, chronic disease, or liver disease. If you're o obesity over uh, BMI over 30, mental health conditions such as depression, and schizophrenia, neurologic disorders, immunocompromised states, HIV, cancer, organ transplant recipients, pregnancy or going to be pregnant or recently pregnant, uh, and some disabilities. So, I mean, I think they should have just recommended it for everybody, period, over six months. But they put those restrictions on. Uh, it's still available, vaccine's still available, and insurance coverage will probably be fine for those over 65 and will be probably, your insurance will probably cover it if you have any of those many risk factors, which is probably most everybody. But if, if you don't, you may have to pay out of pocket. And I would. I would definitely pay out of pocket. Okay, uh, my health care facility, Kaiser, depends on CDC recommendations for immunizations. Any ideas of how immunizations will be handled going forward? I'm also concerned the early development of flu and COVID boost boosters based on variant projection might be uh, impacted. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I'm, I'm worried about it too. But right now, the FDA has already picked the uh, trivalent vaccine for flu in the next season, and it's really based on what was this season. So it's H1N1, H3N2 were the two major influenza A viruses that were in, uh, flu viruses that we had this season. Influenza B virus, uh, it's all going to be the same in the next iteration of vaccines. And the CD still, still recommends annual flu shots for everyone six months and older, and for those of us in the higher AI, age group, 65 or older, a high dose with adjuvant. So we get the, the old vaccine. Okay, COVID variants causing razor blade throat. Now this is one I actually didn't, I, I didn't know about that until someone <laughs> told me that wrote in. So what is this with the painful razor blade throat? So I, I mentioned a few weeks ago that there is an emerging variant. It, it's NB1.8.1. It's now got a nickname called Nimbus. I don't know who came up with that. And it's associated with the quotes, dreaded razor blades, the throat symptom. Basically, it's a really bad sore throat. Now, it's true that any of the COVID, uh, any of the COVID varieties give a, can give a bad sore throat, but this one seems to be particularly bad. What's interesting is this is emerging as the major variant now. It seems to be a, a more transmissible because of mutations in the spike protein, but it doesn't seem to be any more uh, virulent. In other words, it doesn't cause any more uh, disease other than the sore throat thing. Uh, and it should be susceptible to the same old antivirals and should be susceptible to vaccination. I'll just show you the most updated thing. All this year, these, the LP8s have been the dominant variant. And then recently, this NB1.81 uh, has become the new uh, emerging variant. I'm sure that very soon it will be the dominant variant. And I showed this when it first was reported about three weeks ago. This is the, 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 the mutation and uh, the relatedness tree of all these viruses. And the only most important thing is they're all Omicrons. All the last several years have been from 2022 have been Omicron variants. Uh, the dominant strain back in 23 was JN1. The dominant strain in 24 were these KP or FLIRT variants. The dominant strain this year has been the LP 8.1 strain. And then this thing showed up, which is a recombination of the XDV1 and JN1. 
and this the one they called NB1.81, which is a new variant Nimbus. So this happens when there's a combination, a recombination event. It combines mutations from many, and it can be more infectious. And that's what's happened. You can see from the traveler's data, this is from waste products from planes and airports. It's going up, and the dominant strain in that group is NB1.8.1. And, and so that means it's more likely having come into the United States from abroad, because there's more of it uh, abroad than in this country. This was originally isolated in, in China and Europe, so okay. And, and it, that should be, <laughs> that should be enough. <laughs> I have more, but I'm being told to stop, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> anyway, I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. And we have some really important ones. First of all, uh, congratulations to Dr. Ken Leao, the professor of surgery. His team managed to do the very first fully robotic heart transplant of any patient in the United States at Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. Uh, this is an amazing technique. So without cracking the sternum, going in through small incisions, he was able to complete a complete uh, uh, heart transplant, which is absolutely technologically amazing and should transform the field. In addition, I want to congratulate Dr. Yvonne Boda, Carla Gonzalez, and Dr. Carlos Amari, who were the first group of residents to complete their rural family medicine residency in Lufkin, Texas. This is a collaboration between St. Luke's Health System Memorial Lufkin and Baylor College of Medicine and the Temple Foundation. We're very proud of these trainees. It's our first real graduate group of rural medicine. Big shout out to the winning teams of the 2025 Education Hackathon that was sponsored by the Huffington Department of Education. First prize went to Better Than Reviewer 2, a proposal to create a curriculum to train postdocs in peer review process with self-directed learning and peer mentoring. Second place went to Clinical Skills Simulator, which proposes an innovative collaboration between BCM and Rice faculty to create a prosthetic simulator that gives real-time feedback to students on the critical process of prosthesis fitting. And finally, I want to really congratulate our own Houston Sabercats, the Western Division champs in rugby. Uh, who are competing in the Super Bowl of Rugby this weekend in Rhode Island. And if you get pictures of them, they have a giant Baylor Medicine on their jerseys. We're very, very proud of them for having another winning season. So congratulations to them and all of the, uh, the shout-out uh, recipients this week. And I can't wait to see you next week. <laughs>